All right, DJ Leroy, we are back on Soul Lounge Primetime, Monday night here in the city. Night Watchmen, man. A whole week has gone by, and you're here again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just keep coming back. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a glutton for punishment. I don't know. So, uh, yeah, so last week... uh, we had the opportunity to go out and uh, and demo these these really exciting new uh, electric scooters um, that uh, this company called Super Pedestrian is trying to bring into New York City. These are called the Link Scooter, and uh, we had a chance to uh, actually get out of Harlem for uh, for a day, and we uh, traversed our way out to the Brooklyn Navy Yards to find out more about. Uh, what's going on? People don't know that DJ Leroy is uh, is very very well uh, tied into the alternative transportation movement here in New York, and uh, and there he is, there he is, the DJ Leroy who actually uh, debuted and tried out this scooter, and let's hear what he had to say about it right there on. So, uh, some um, thoughts about the experience? Exhilarating. Very, very nice ride. Uh, being that this is my first time, definitely have to get actually uh, adjusted to acceleration. Uh, but beyond that, once you kind of get, get the hang of it and also realize that you are in control because you have brakes that are more than adequate, it's a great ride. Wow. Right. wow! Wow! Yeah, you know that was a it was a really really incredible and exhilarating experience. So mm-hmm. needless to say, in terms of as you said, getting uh, involved with uh, alternative transportation modes, mm-hmm. it could only be one person. Okay, and then of course being Paul Steely White. All right. <laughs> oh man, what an intro! In the building. I can't. I can't live up to that. Uh, uh, yes, you can, buddy. I know you. <laughs> so yes, you can. <laughs> What's up, buddy? Hey, really, such an honor to be on the show. The Night Watchman, DJ Leroy. I mean, New York institutions. Um, thanks for having me on. Uh-huh. Absolutely. We, we Absolutely. didn't even have to pay him to say that. <laughs> And, and so you know what, uh, Paul? There was somebody that you also introduced me to, who also goes by the name of Paul. Uh, but yeah. To differentiate, I guess you call him Tall Paul. Exactly. I mean, I'm not small. I'm not. I'm not short. But but Tall Paul is just that. I mean, what are you? Six 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 seven. I'm six five, but like yeah, I, I'm just I'm Tall Paul. <laughs> Well, welcome, well, gentlemen. How you guys doing, man? I'm Wonderful. doing very well. Thank you very much for inviting us on. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have to I have definitely, definitely say that that was a hell of an, hell of an experience, experience on, on uh, Friday. Friday. Um, um, really, really micro mobility. I want to hear your thoughts. Your thoughts. Is, Is that, that the future, the future of, transportation of transportation in New York, in New York especially, especially post COVID? I mean. Tall Paul and I have worked in the industry for the last couple of years, you know, for some leading micromobility companies. So we're, you know, we've, we've had the Kool-Aid, you know, we're, we're in the tank. Um, and I think for good reason, you know, we all know that we need better transportation options. And so many cities have discovered just how easy it is to do a city bike type program, but using electric scooters, Instead of bicycles, Instead of bicycles they're, they're they're easier, easier to, park, to park. They're cheaper, cheaper you know, you know, and they ride, they ride if they're built right. They ride really, they ride really well. well. They get to you they know where you need to go. go. So, so New York is a little late to the late party. To you know, LA, LA, San Francisco, San Francisco Paris, Paris. Now London, now London is, doing is doing it. But I think but that I think the, the hesitancy, hesitancy I think has been in many ways warranted. You know, just because we have so many pedestrians, people want to make sure that the scooters are safe. So, so this new this company, company Super Pedestrian, Super Pedestrian that, I that I work for, you know, Paul's tall, Paul's, Paul's helping out a bit. bit. You know, we think we have a better mousetrap. We think we've built a city-friendly, pedestrian-friendly scooter. And I want to come back to something you said, DJ Leroy, about the acceleration and sort of getting used to it. There's a bit of a learning curve there. 
and you know we just we won, just won a privilege, privilege you know to operate in the city of city Seattle, Seattle. And, and what we're doing with them is we're bringing down, down the top speed, speed from, from usually it's 15, 15 miles per hour, hour. but if it's but your if first, first ride, ride we're only going to let you go eight. Wow. So oh that's that's give give people a chance to get their get their legs under yeah right right. Especially no, no. all those people in Seattle are all hopped up on caffeine, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, somebody. Indeed, yeah, with the and, uh, double frappuccino. Are you? Pie. I have to say, since this is this is you know Soul Lounge, and believe it or not, earlier tonight I was actually listening to some old Sir Mexalot. You guys familiar with Sir Mexalot? Oh hell yes, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. you know. Posse on Broadway, I was thinking there's got to be a scooter version to that. <laughs> Instead of a Black Ben's limo with a cellular phone. He's bragging about having a cellular phone. This is like 1987, right? <laughs> you can't make it up, stuff. I'm not paying rent. I got my link. <laughs> Scooter with the geo fence. I'm glad nice. you went there instead of me. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yes, I ride geo fence. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, so, Paul, I am interested. Uh, how did you get into the space in terms of really transportation alternatives and also micro mobility? Well, you know, we're we're bike guys. I mean, Curtis, you know, we met through our mutual affinity for bicycles. You know, Tall Paul and I met on the Brooklyn Bridge, both riding. Were we both riding city bikes, Paul? Uh, I was riding a city bike, and you were on a hybrid electric going uphill very easily. I was cheating. I was hard. Yeah, you were cheating. I just want to be clear. Okay, that's how it started. Okay, I was cheating. Yeah, I'll, I'll own that. Um, but you know. I'll always be a bike guy at heart, but the thing about micro mobility, electric scooters, and now electric bikes too, is it just they? It's like democratizing bicycle. You, anybody can do it. You can get to your meeting without, you know, breaking a sweat. It's just you know super convenient. So it's it's really just like bringing that bike experience, you know, to a, a whole nother level. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, gotcha. So now, uh, tall Paul. Yes, sir. In terms of you, now it, it's a small world to, to know that you also grew up there in Co-op City in the Bronx. BX, buddy, BX. Uh, how did you get into the whole uh, alternative transportation mode and uh, micro mobility? Well, so that's it's kind of two questions because I've been a bike rider since I was a puppy up in Co-op City. Uh, I'm an urban rider. I've got tens of thousands of miles riding my bike and all of them basically in new york city i don't even like to go to jersey because if i go across the george washington bridge there's no subway to get me home safe and sound so i i mean it sounds funny uh, but i'm much more comfortable riding in the city than i would be in the suburbs i mean that's just because of the you know experience really mm -hmm. uh i got into my mobility actually because of meeting paul um mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, we first met in 2017, which, uh, you know, we haven't known each other a really long time, but we've become fast friends. Uh, met him. We have a shared passion for, for bicycles, and so that's how we really connected. And in conversations over the course of time, uh, he connected me with some folks that were uh, looking to get into the pilot program for micro mobility that was coming. First, it was dockless bikes, uh, dockless e-bikes, dockless bicycles. Those were uh, the two companies he connected me with were Jump, which was uh, acquired by Uber right around that same time. And the other one was a company called Lime. At the time, it was Lime Bike. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was lucky enough to start working with Lime Bike doing community relations work. And that's how, that's really my connection to it. Uh, the industry itself, micro mobility, kind of shifted from bikes to scooters. Uh, roughly speaking, in 2018, there were a couple of companies that were doing the scooters. Bird is the one that has the biggest name or had the biggest name at that point. And e scooters, uh, I can tell you from real numbers. Uh, the the adoption rate amongst women in particular was like 40 40 percent higher for the scooters rather than bicycles and in order to capture market a number of the companies started to shift towards scooters and Paul did mention that the manufacturing costs and the replacement costs seem to be a little bit cheaper than bicycles and 
you know, that, that, that plus the advances of technology uh, led to that. I don't want to go too much into the weeds on that, but really scooters are interesting to me because they give a chance for people to get out of their cars and into a mode of transportation that is uh, cheaper, faster, and more convenient in many ways. And in a fairly, a slightly recent life, you guys were also working with Revel, I understand, in terms of tr helping them to navigate some of the hiccups that they were experiencing. What had happened there? Yeah, well, you know, Paul and I are in the industry, and, you know, I think it's interesting. It's, it's still a relatively small group of people who are leading a lot of these efforts. And so I had an opportunity to you know, uh, work with Revel on some of the safety issues they're experiencing that, you know, this summer, they had a few deaths and they were looking to beef up their safety protocol and do it in a way that was smart and, and really in sync with, you know, local communities and also good policy. And so I called up Paul, tall Paul, I said, tall Paul, I'm going to need your help on this project. So it was great that we were able to work together on that. It was a short engagement, maybe just a month. And, you know, helping Rebel get back on the road and enhance their safety program. Um, you know, I, I hope they do more. I think they will do more moving forward, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, it's really a golden age in a way of just like more ways of getting around. But everyone agrees that safety is paramount. And part of that is just, you know, reorienting our streets around people instead of cars and, you know, people in smaller, smaller vehicles instead of cars. But a lot of it, too, is about behavior and, and, and people, you know, learning, you know, new ways to respect one another. And that's where I think working with Tall Paul, I've just learned so much. And I think there's just so much left to do to sort of change the culture on our streets and you know, you know, Tall, tall Paul's kind of what I consider to be my my, my spirit, spirit guide, guide on that. <laughs> 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 Let me ask you guys, um, what do you think about obviously city city bike really kind of opened the space up here in New York and, and, and they went through a few iterations before they got to where they are now. Um, were there some things that were learned out of city uh, bikes experiences that helped um, set up um, a lot of the new ventures that are coming on now. Uh, I mean, ahead, I mean, Tall Paul's put in what more than eight thousand miles on city bikes so far. Or something. Wow, yeah, no, I lost count. <laughs> yeah. I lost count. I, I'm up at about uh, eighty two hundred miles on city bike, give or take. So what I would say there is twofold. Uh, the city bike model was very very helpful for the sector overall. Because you had uh, you had a company come in uh, now, mind you, the corporate hands have, uh, have uh, the companies changed hands on the corporate level multiple times. But the model of providing uh, shared bicycles in a city like New York was a very big deal. Because basically, if you can do it here, you can do it anywhere. So City Bike was able to gain ground, literally and figuratively, here in New York, and get people to adopt. Uh, their bikes so that they could use them as uh, primary transportation. I can tell you a couple of years ago that uh, I guess it was summer of 2017, I rode the subway a total of eight times between March and October. Eight. And I don't have a car, right? I gave up my car because I live in downtown Brooklyn. You have a car, you have car problems. Yes. And the idea of being able to basically ride a bike everywhere without having to worry about my bike being stolen, which is, you know, this is, uh, this is New York. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a very big deal. So what I would say with City Bike, they were able to basically prove the concept on a corporate level, and that allowed other people to say, hey, wait, this shared, this shared transportation model can work. What else can we do? And the, the other thing that I would say there is that uh, their, their foothold here in, in New York was based in Manhattan and downtown Brooklyn because theirs was a model that was based on land acquisition. It was really a real estate deal, right? Because you had to be able to connect uh, their docking stations were all in Manhattan, then a little bit in Brooklyn, and they've slowly been expanding outward, which is fine for people living in Manhattan and downtown Brooklyn and in their expansion area. But if you're in a place like Co-op City, 
a place like Staten Island or a place like the Rockaways where Lyme had their, uh, where they had their pilot programs, you were out a lot. And that is a, that was and is a major challenge. And that is why the Bacchus Revolution is a very, very big deal. And uh, the passage of the e-scooter and e-bike law here in New York State by Governor Cuomo and the legislature is a very, very big deal. I mean, Paul can speak to uh, more of the uh, more more about this, but I think that that's it. Really, is a game changer for everyone. Gotcha. Now, now what was is City City Bank is just um, it's just more or less a licensing and branding play for them, correct? That's correct. Mm -hmm. And they pay a significant amount of money for that, and that helps the model, or. I, Paul, I, I don't remember what the original contract was, but I think that they have basically naming rights, just like they have uh, City Field. It's mm -hmm. naming rights. That's all mm -hmm. that is. Yep. Mm -hmm. And That's how long it. do those rights actually go for? I think it's it's definitely a multiple year contract. I want to say it's it's three, possibly five years um, mm -hmm. per contract. You know, ten tens of millions. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but the um, the term dockless that that Paul used, you know. It's, it's interesting just to think about where the models are evolving because I think what may be true here in New York and other cities is that, you know, true dockless fleets where they're not really required to park at a dock or a designated area, you know, maybe not the best model because what we're seeing is that a hybrid model of, you know, some docks in really dense, you know, downtown areas are necessary just for to keep the fleets tidy and to keep bikes or scooters from, you know, cluttering up the sidewalk too much. Um, but then in other areas, letting them free float a little bit. And then what I like are these, you know, just small, small sort of, you know, parklet kind of areas, not as big as a city bike dock, but enough to park, you know, three or four scooters, maybe just a stencil, maybe just like half of a parking spot. And then, and then companies, companies like Super like Pedestrian, Pedestrian, which runs these uh, link scooters, mm -hmm. are also figuring out how to really ensure that people are parking in the right place. So like if you try to park your scooter in the wrong place or even try to ride in the wrong place, and this is getting back to that geofencing issue, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, the scooter just won't let you go there. It'll just stop. Yeah, so let's, let's talk stop. a little bit more yeah. about that because you guys have some, some, some really interesting technology that's a part of the link scooter. So maybe you can explain a little bit more about how that works. Yeah. 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 So, so, I mean, really the magic is in this virtual, virtual geofence geo where, where, you know, the GPS the coordinates are loaded onto the scooter. the scooter. So the scooter so knows, knows where, where it is it in relation to the street environment. environment. And so you can, so program, you can program the scooter so, so it won't, won't go into a into sensitive, sensitive pedestrian area. area. Mm -hmm. uh, and now all now companies all are trying to do this, but I think what makes ours unique is that we don't rely, we don't on, a rely on a cellular, cellular connection, connection for that, for that scooter, scooter to talk to, talk to the cloud, cloud and then and then back, back again. Everything's, everything's on the scooter, on the scooter itself, itself, so it doesn't even need, need the cellular, cellular connection, connection, so there's no so there's time, time lag. Because with other geofences, you, geofences, you, cross, you the cross the boundary, and then you're like, you're like 20 feet, 30 feet into the pedestrian plaza before it actually kicks in. So, you know, being able to get more accurate geofencing in is really uh, critical, critical to, to operate, to operate in, in, in a dense environment. environment. So, this, so the technology is getting better, better, and I think companies, companies are figuring, figuring out that they can't just come into a city and run roughshod, right? right? They've got to work with the city bureaucracy. They've got to understand, understand that, that it's better, it's to, better ask to ask for permission, permission than forgiveness, because a lot of companies were just dumping scooters on the street to grab market share, and that was just not a good look for the sector, sector because, because you know, you know it was like oh it is another, another uber, uber this is another, another big company that's just coming in and bullying, bullying mm -hmm. cities so, so really, I, really think I think there's a more there's sensitive, sensitive approach required, approach required here. here now also revel um has obviously had a little bit of experience in the market they're relatively new as you mentioned they had a few uh, hiccups but there obviously was some things to be learned about their model too because their model is actually a fully dockless model and i think we should probably just make sure that we explain that the way it works is uh you uh you download an app on your on your smartphone and then on the smartphone you can locate where the the closest scooter is to you and you you can reserve that scooter for a period of time and then go go use it i suppose 
there, there, there is a reservation model, but most, most, most often you're just seeing where the scooters are, just as you said, and then going up to, you know, finding the scooter and then just, you know, quick scan of the QR code in the, in the app and then off you go. And we also have options for people without smartphones to just, you know, uh, use a prepaid debit card, which is popular in some cities, you know, and cities are really requiring companies to have more tools so that people have more universal access, which is a good thing, obviously, you know, um, but coming back to Rome for a sec, you know, it's a little different because, you know, they're, they're mopeds, right? So they're in the street, they can sort of park at the curb like a motorcycle would. Um, so, you know, dockless may be more appropriate for a powered, you know, vehicle moped, like a, like a rebel, but, you know, for, for scooters and bikes, there's just more inclination for them to be on the sidewalk to yeah. block, right. you know, ramps for disabled folks and, and that and sort of thing. So it becomes that way more important. liability sort of, issues too, I would imagine. Exactly. Big yes. time. Big time. So mm -hmm. in a way, this is an appropriate time to micromanage, if you will. Micromanage micromobility <laughs> so that you're... <laughs> so that mm -hmm. you're you know, minding minding your fleet and keeping them from uh, cluttering up the public realm. Mm -hmm. uh, one quick one quick point: uh, the Ripple scooters are actually uh, governed by New York State law. They are plated like a motorcycle or like a car, mm -hmm. and they have a maximum speed of thirty miles an hour. Mm -hmm. and so they're a little bit; they're, they're significantly different than uh, the stand up scooters that we're talking about. In, in, the case of super pedestrian and link as well as lime and some of the others uh with the rebel scooters uh because it's a, a vespa style scooter you can get two people on them uh, mm -hmm. a big deal is that uh there is a helmet requirement for mm -hmm. them uh mm -hmm. there's a little pod on the back that carries two helmets uh the you know the hiccups that we spoke about frankly you know i mean Sadly, those were tragedies. So was, there was a total of three people that passed away within about a 14-day period in July. Mm -hmm. And so what Revel did, which was really you know, unusual for the sector, is rather than waiting for the city to do something, they decided to suspend operations so that they could be proactive about implementing new safety measures to make sure that more people would be able to uh, take advantage of their platform. So uh, big things were they required everyone to wear a helmet. I mean, they suggested it before, but now in order to open up a Rebel scooter, you have to take a selfie of yourself with the helmet on. And they want, you send that to the company, once they see you with the helmet on, then they will unlock the scooter and allow you to, to ah, ride. Interesting. And so that's a that's a big deal. The other thing that was very important in in my view and, and safety. Paul mentioned that uh, I'm a safety specialist in this sector. Uh, they have uh, implemented a twenty a thirty question, roughly speaking, twenty minute quiz that you must take when you're opening up a level for the first time. And yes. I think of it sort of like a, a learner's permit test. Mm -hmm. They want you to understand the rules of the road. They want you to understand how the vehicle operates, what you're supposed to do, what you're not supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And these things are extraordinarily important because rider behavior, driver behavior, so to speak, uh, is the most important element of safe operations of any motor vehicle. It doesn't matter whether it's a car, a scooter, a truck, a boosted skateboard, whatever it is. You have to have people doing the right thing. And you have to have, frankly, you have to have a critical mass of people doing it right all the time so that others will follow the behavior. If you and they people, also, in addition sorry, to that, in addition to that test, you all, there's also a face-to-face safety training that you also have to do with Rebel? Well, at this point, they're offering that. Uh, they started offering that a long time ago, actually, at their offices in Gowanus. Mm -hmm. And they, they are planning on doing face-to-face uh, -face safety trainings throughout the city, but that's a, a model that they are working on. So I don't have... No, really I think it's, it's, it's running because I, I, you know, I had signed up for Rebel just before they shut down. So they sent me some email... I just did the 20 minute test yesterday, I think. But then the next step is I have to book the uh, the in person thing. So that is outstanding news. I, yeah. I, I wasn't even aware. I think that's wonderful. Yeah. I really, right. really, really. 
So I think that does make the difference because obviously there were a lot of people who were using the Revel safe, safely. I heard about it from a friend who loved it. But I know that there were a lot of uh, young kids who were on it and they were riding it on the bike paths and they were at, at a bunch of places where they weren't supposed to. So I think that they, they absolutely have taken the right steps to, uh, to do it. And then, of course, with Revel, you also have to have a driver's license. So that is a... A limited model. You guys obviously have a bigger market. I'm assuming that you don't need a driver's license for the uh, for the uh, the link scooter. You just need to uh, some proof that you're 18 years and older. Uh, mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be a driver's license, but right. could, you know, right now minors aren't allowed on the platform. That's mm -hmm. a good idea too. Yeah, uh, absolutely. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And now, one of the things that you guys had also mentioned, I think you mentioned this, uh, Tall Paul. In, in terms of, I guess, in terms of a lot of the micro mobility folks coming from the West Coast, but these guys are right at MIT. Yeah. So do you see a difference because they are East Coast based? Well, I'm I'm going to let uh, the smaller of the Pauls. The diminutive Paul. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll let him handle most of that, but I will. And just, just so your listeners know, I'm 6'2", okay? So like... <laughs> oh, man. And that's why we call him Tiny. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, NBA, you know, think, NBA rules. <laughs> Tall Paul might, ag might agree that, you know, part of what has ailed the, the, the sector and I think really led to some, some pushback that they've experienced in many cities is this sort of arrogance in, in, in companies have sometimes where they're coming into a city and you know acting like they own the streets and that you know you know they're god's gift and that cities should sort of you know figure out how to work around them instead of vice versa and so i think some of that is you know stems from just all this like hot venture capital that's been pouring into these firms from a lot of you know west coast sort of tech-minded venture capital firms that are looking for a big payday tomorrow you know, mm. these, are, these are companies that are like okay let's grow for 10 years and try to make a sustainable business this is like let's have a rocket ship that blasts off and then we all get paid in 18 months because we're going to ipo you know and it's just like that kind of mentality it just does not bode well for integrating within a transportation ecosystem like new york right it's like you got so much going on in the streets you've got to just be in it for the yeah, long haul to figure it out. it out. And so, so what I like what about, about Super Pedestrian, Link, Link, and really any really company that's on the East Coast, Coast that's in micromobility, and there are very few, few right now, right now mm -hmm. is that I just, I think there's just a different mindset. It's like our cities are old, we have old infrastructure, there's a lot more transit use, there's a lot more walking in East Coast cities versus West Coast. And so I just think there's just, more of an in general, I don't, want to, I don't want to just make a blanket statement, but I think in general, there's just more of an awareness of the need to be mindful as you're integrating a new mode into the urban existing urban urban fabric. Uh, tall Paul, if you could also talk about because I know you also have approached the space um, from a kind of a community perspective, and, mm. and maybe you can share some of your your thoughts on on you know what the benefits are for this community, for communities that have, let's call them transportation deserts, if you will. Sure. Uh, my entree into the sector was as community relations person for Lime, one of the companies that were, had pilot program, as I mentioned before. And I took community relations to, uh, you know, I was, frankly, I was the first person that Lime hired that was local here. And I took community relations very seriously, uh, and so I took an expansive view of that. I talked to everyone. I talked to folks that worked in uh, Niger. I spoke with net worth individuals and everyone in between. I spoke with elected officials. I spoke with uh, small businesses. I spoke with uh, business improvement districts and chambers of commerce. Why was I talking to all of these people? Because everyone shares the street. Everyone shares the street. And so if you take the time to listen to people to find out what is it that they need from you as a service provider, then maybe you'll have a real chance to do some good. So one thing, you know, there's a couple of things that come to mind very easily. And one is that 
when people are in the transportation desert, you can use that in, uh, the best way to describe that. If you're living in a two fare zone or sometimes even a three fare zone in New York, that is a real drag. I grew up in Co-op City up in the North and East Bronx. And that means that you're roughly speaking a 20 minute walk from the closest train station. Uh, I was in section one, which was uh, closest to the Dyer Avenue, the end of the Dyer Avenue line, or the second stop is Baychester Avenue. I'm sorry for yep. going into detail. Or if you're in section five, you're relatively close to the, the number six train, the Pelham Bay, the end of the Pelham Bay. But in both cases, most people aren't going to take that walk. They're thinking about taking the bus. And if you have to take the bus, it's a coordination of getting onto the bus, to your train, and you're starting to get to Not to mention Co-op City is huge. There's you know, some 45,000 people living in Co-op City and 35 high rises. And there's a giant mall in Bay Plaza that's kind of in the middle. But if you're at the end of that place, that's a 15, 20 minute walk. This is not convenient. So when you're talking about the opportunity to have something like a linked scooter in a place like that, or in Staten Island, or in Rockaways, where where Lime had uh, uh, its pilot program, you're giving people the chance to get around locally, to go to local institutions, go to local restaurants, to do business locally that they couldn't do before. Because if you have a car, you, you take your car, you're giving up your parking spot, you get to the place where you're trying to go, you have to find parking there. Then when you go home, you have to try to find parking again. And if time is money, think about every time you're moving your car and it's going to take you anywhere between 10 minutes and an hour to find a spot where you can go. That's real. The, and you know, we have Uber and Lyft and all these options out there now, but those things are expensive. And so, so you know, listen, I, I, I don't mean to preach, but I will say that there's a couple of things that are very, very important in terms of this. Uh, Super Pedestrian is going to be offering a very significant uh, discount to people who are on public assistance or living in nature properties, right? And that means instead of it costing, say, a dollar to I don't know the exact figures. Paul can answer this, but let's just say in a dollar to a, a scooter, it's fifty cents, and instead of it being twenty cents uh, per minute, it's ten cents. All of a sudden, you know, a trip that a trip that might have been Uber Lyft that would be ten or fifteen dollars, well, that could end up being like five dollars, and you're getting right to where you're trying to go with less hassle. I mean, I mean it, it really it does, does make a difference. And, they, and you can make the value proposition, especially to small businesses, that by partnering with a company like uh, Super Pedestrian Lake and allowing scooters to be parked and potentially even charged at that location, you're going to increase foot traffic in that place, whether it's a restaurant or a bodega or a, or a small supermarket or something like that. If you can drive local businesses, excuse me, drive customers or have customers ride to those local businesses, then all of a sudden you're changing your dynamic. Maybe they don't, they don't need to go to Costco or whatever you know, place that they're going to leave their neighborhood for to go and do their shopping. I mean, it, it really can be a game changer for local businesses. And I, I work very, very hard on expanding that platform with the people that I work with. I was with Lime. And certainly Paul can talk in there. Great. Um, I'd like to take a second here. Um, I know that you guys um, this past week um, got some, got a, had a, uh, um, a segment done uh, by New York One. I'd like for us to just take a, t take a quick look at that. And then uh, let's talk a little bit after that about uh, how you guys are going to deploy. So okay. let's take a look at this here. New Yorkers may be seeing these electric powered scooters zipping up and down streets next year. It's definitely something that I would try. It was a smooth ride. It was easy to operate. Austin based startup Super Pedestrian calls its electric scooter sharing service Link. The company demonstrated its ride Thursday at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. It's one of several companies eager to be part of a pilot for an e-scooter share program, similar to city bike rentals. The boundaries have yet to be determined, but Manhattan will be off limits. I can actually see that there uh, would be a demand for folks because, as you know, during the pandemic, there has been a, a reluctance of folks going back to either the trains, 
or uh, buses in New York. Do you want to try it? I would absolutely like, want to try it. E-scooters are part of a trend called micro-mobility, personal electric devices that have become a transportation alternative to cars, taxis, and mass transit, particularly since the pandemic. Scooter share programs have popped up in cities around the country and world, but the programs can cause headaches for pedestrians when people ride them on sidewalks or park them carelessly. Reps for Super Pedestrian showed off their scooter's safety feature. The device automatically slows down and powers down if it rolls into an area it should not be in. The first boundary is at these first orange cones, and that's where the scooter will automatically slow from 15 miles per hour to 7.5 miles per hour. And then at that other orange cone, the scooter will automatically stop. A fix to a problem that has bedeviled other cities. The city has been you know, reluctant to actually open the streets to shared micromobility because they want to make sure that fleets can stay away from sidewalks and stay away from pedestrian areas. The city and state this year legalized e-scooters, permitting them to go up to 15 miles an hour. The city law also authorized a test of the scooter rideshare program. They are different from electric mopeds, which were already legal and can travel 30 miles an hour. They are used by the Rebel Mopeds moped sharing service. The city will be soliciting proposals from e-scooter operators by October 15th, with a pilot to launch outside of Manhattan as early as March. In Brooklyn, Dan Rivoli, New York One. All right, so you guys are on your way. <laughs> so now if you say outside of, let's say, Manhattan, of course, Harlem is a part of that. So I say Harlem will not be included in the first rollout, huh? Unfortunately, you know, it was it's a long story why Manhattan was carved out, but the 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 sort of uh, optimistic interpretation is that there was just hesitancy, you know, based on density, right? Just more pedestrians, more crowded sidewalks. And then that's fair. You know, I think we, we as an industry still have a lot to prove. So, and there's plenty of people who need to be served in the boroughs, right? And in a way, that's even more important to some of the points Paul was making about two fair zones, three fair zones. You know, the thing that I really love about the opportunity in the boroughs is that if you think about, you know, what the catchment area is around a subway stop and what's a 10-minute walk, it's about a half a mile, right? But a 10-minute scooter ride, all of a sudden, it's like two miles, right? So, you can really expand your reach and i love the point too paul made tall paul made about local businesses and so it's really i think going to knit the city together in some really new and fabulous ways but safety has to be first and so in addition to the geofencing that we talked about the thing i really love about this scooter is that it anticipates problems that may be happening before they actually become problems, right? So the computers on the scooter can detect a small fluctuation in the power that's going to the battery or from the battery to the motor. And it can shut the scooter down if there's an issue or it can just, you know, create its own repair ticket. But that same technology also allows us to operate fleets more cheaply, right? So that we're not having to buy spare parts. We can fix the problems before they require that kind of thing. So. I'm, I'm I'm very optimistic, very optimistic that, that with the right technology, the right, technology, attitude, the right attitude, a company, company can, can be very successful, very successful and, and really play a meaningful play role in getting New York, New York, you know, back, back on its on feet, feet post COVID. So now, now with your pilot in um, Brooklyn, are you taking on all of Brooklyn in the pilot, or are you just a specific area? We don't know where the DOT wants us to go. You know, there's there's going to be several companies applying this fall for mm -hmm. slots, um, and the and the pilot would actually start in March of 21. Okay. But we don't know how they're going to divvy up the areas. They could do it several different ways. But you know, I hope we do get the opportunity to go to the neighborhoods Paul was mentioning. Really, any neighborhood with a transit desert. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we, we want to, you know, bring the service to neighborhoods that are hurting the most, um, you know, for transportation. If I could jump in just for one moment, one of the things that's important, and yeah, that is a phone in my background, sorry. That's all right. One of the things that is, in my view, very important is that neighborhoods that need 
alternative transportation mm -hmm. should have an opportunity to get it. Uh, and, you know, the fact that Harlem will be excluded in these pilots because Harlem of uh, the, Harlem being located in Manhattan, uh, that really had more to do with downtown rather than uptown because yeah. 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 And that's how I think. Heights and Inwood could all benefit from you know, these, you know, technologies, these technologies because, because again, again you know, faster, faster, cheaper, more, more convenient, convenient for the people living there. Living there. But, you know, you it, know because, because of density, 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 density issues, issues that are very, are very real, real, it is extremely, it is extremely important, important to get it right. right. What I'm but hoping for the DOT, honestly, is that it will, they will allow there to be what I call a mass of scooters deployed. So, for example, during the pilot program, uh, it was 200 bikes uh, that I jump at the other company. Uh, actually, it seems like had a different option that they were uh, testing with the Bronx. But 200 to 250 units is nowhere near enough to prove the value proposition. So for example, if somebody wants to use a, a, a scooter or a bike as their first mile or last mile in getting to the primary transportation or coming home, you know, getting from that uh, egress point to their home, if there's only 200 and you've got thousands of people traveling, they can't use that reliably get to work. That's, it's just, uh, so they're not, they're not that, that's, that, that's what happened, happened to, I can state clearly, clearly that's what happened, what happened in the rock waste of that island. island. It, it, you know, the, the, the units were not were adopted not because it wasn't a reliable, reliable form of transportation for them. Not that the platform wasn't reliable, reliable. but you, you didn't have it you know, on the ground, ground you didn't you didn't use that as an option. option. So your boss isn't going to say, oh, it's okay to roll into work a half hour but you couldn't find a bike or a scooter, right? So I'm, so I'm hoping, hoping that the DOT will, will allow there to be enough, enough units, units on, the on the ground in each territories, territories so that so the value proposition can be proven. And the second thing very, very briefly there, there is that, again, again uh, it is it important is to think about places, places where, where transportation, transportation can be facilitated. So, for example, so example Sandy up in the Bronx has a ferry terminal, right? The YC Ferry, which is this wonderful thing if you're going to get to ride one. You know, they're, they're cheap and they're quick and they can get you around. The ride from Soundview to Lower Manhattan, I think it's about 35 to 40 minutes, which is certainly faster than the train would be and probably about as fast as a car would be in most circumstances. But the only way to get to Soundview is by a bus. There's a bus line that goes down there. And if you're driving your park car to try to get to that ferry terminal, well, everybody in Soundview has a car. So there's no car. But... If you could put scooters up there, I'm sure, listen, this is me coming with a number from the top of my head, but I would bet that you could either triple or quadruple the number of people riding those shows instantaneously if you were able to have a pilot up there in town. And that's just one example of a place you could say that in the Rockwells, or likely any other places in the city as well. And that's just one example of being able to facilitate adding an option to the transportation infrastructure that will help people, you know, get around. Okay. Uh, well, gentlemen, gentlemen, I have a question. Have a question. So, so, so let's say, let's say I'm, not I'm not necessarily a spring chicken, chicken anymore, anymore, right? Right. Now, yeah, I, I definitely, I, 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 Captain Obvious. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I did enjoy, of course, uh, trying the link scooter. You know, the yeah, upright, upright position. position. Any, thought Any thought to, to diversifying, diversifying or changing the fleet, the fleet slightly, slightly to allow, allow for a, a sit-down sit position, position for some, for some older, older folks? folks. Yeah, you know, yeah, you know and, and it's, it's not just, not just uh, you know, folks of a, of a certain age that might that prefer, prefer a sit-down sit -down position. You know, I, I think a lot of people... I mean, what we're a culture that's been sitting on our butts in cars for generations, right? So, true. Um, you know, there's we call this you know different form factors, right? Like just you know different types of vehicles that are still electric powered. And you know, I like to think of the era we're in now as like um, I can't remember the name of the um, post dinosaur era, but when the dinosaurs became extinct, you had all these small mammals evolving you know, and all these different. You know, the car is a dinosaur; it's becoming extinct, and now you have all these. Little devices, devices that are evolving very rapidly. Very rapidly. So, so I think we're going to see a proliferation of different, of different types, types, you know, three wheelers, you know, two wheelers, wheelers you know, seated, non-seated. Non -seated. You know, I know the, I team, know the team 
up in Cambridge, at, you know, super pedestrian. They're working on a number of exciting new, you know, vehicle types to make nice. it easier for folks and more accessible. And I think every city is going to require an accessible option too, right? So for you know more, more like sort of an ambulatory, you know, setup for you know for folks who have you know those kinds of challenges, but. You know, it's just it's such, such an exciting, exciting time, time because, because the, you know, the motors, the batteries, the batteries have just gotten to the point where you can really do some creative things to get people moving. I know so, somebody who has one of the uh, kind of one wheel. Yeah. Like, yeah. A, like a, you know, like a like a um, unicycle almost. Huh? Yeah. And they had one commutes. in the New York one clip. Yeah. Yeah. He, well, uh, yeah, it's not quite that one. There's one that that more looks like a like a like a uh, like a skateboard. Uh, with a wheel on. Oh, it. right, 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 right. Yes, right. and uh, he commutes. Okay. He commutes from Harlem to Wall Street every day. Wow. wow. Which is to me, it's like mind-boggling. <sighs> but what do you think is the typical range for your type of scooter? A comfortable range for somebody? Yeah, that you well, anticipate. You know, it's yeah. it's interesting. Before COVID, the average trip length in the industry was just about a mile. Like mm. 1.2 miles per trip. Mm -hmm. Since COVID, it's more like two miles per trip. So, so people are really not using other modes of transportation for obvious reasons, right? And they're they're wanting that sort of distanced, uh, you know, easier option. But here at Super Pedestrian, we're we're finding an average trip length of three miles per trip. Wow, now. interesting. And I think that has to do just you know we have a large it's a larger scooter than others and it's like mm -hmm. a little bit more of a cush cusher yeah. cusher ride, but mm -hmm. um, you know so so in terms of trip range you know it's uh, you know one to three seems to be the the sweet spot, mm -hmm. and we we're getting about fifty five miles per battery charge right so we only have to charge our scooters about every four days mm -hmm. or so so um, that's how it looks like you know the big picture. And I would say that if you guys. Sorry. You know, one of the, my experience was that I found it a lot easier once I tried it, and yeah, I know yeah. that if I spent more time on it, I would probably feel very comfortable with going for a much longer distance than I would have suspected. So I think that for you guys, getting people to try it is probably going to be one of your best marketing, just like you did with us. You know, you, yeah. Well, you know, thank you. you. You guys, you were good sports and. That was like pretty much the first one we did. So mm -hmm. great to be off on the right foot. Mm -hmm. um, we're we're going to be in Brooklyn Bridge Park uh, Friday the 25th. Mm -hmm. And then I think we're looking to go to uh, maybe the Queens Bri Bridge Houses mm -hmm. and uh, maybe Astoria, you know, going to Queens a little bit. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think it, it definitely is an experiential thing, um, uh, Bob, for, mm -hmm. for, for real. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're right out about that. Mm hmm mm-hmm yeah. so how long is the pilot we'll see it'll it'll, it'll probably be six months uh -huh. maybe longer mm -hmm. you know i think i think things are a little up in the air right now just because the dot is so stretched dealing with all the new ways people are using streets mm -hmm. which you know it's really a challenge for them because they have to manage gravel now and city bike and Mm -hmm. All the all the sidewalk cafes that are now in the street, which yeah. we, we, we might agree is a good thing. Uh, I also noticed a city bike quietly slipped some electric bikes in into their fleet. Yes, indeed, um, they're 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 coming right in, and they're extraordinarily popular. I mean, mm. they, they had a few hiccups when they first announced the electric fleet, mm -hmm. but uh, I think they figured those out, and so. Yeah, it's a whole new world, you know. I think we're just going to see so many more people discovering, you know, the joys and, and conveniences of, of, you know, getting around with a small vehicle. I see somebody with the electric city bike, and I'm like, you're cheating. You're cheating. <laughs> Pedal. <laughs> well, those are speed limited to 15 miles an hour as well, by the way. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. So you, you can't, you know, what the, the big advantage with the electric city bike is that uh, you, won't you won't sweat. sweat. Right. So, you know, I can tell you in the first round of those that if I was going to a meeting in Manhattan, I would look for the electric city bike because I knew I could take the bridge and not be sweating when I got to my right. bike. Go upstairs. Mm -hmm. Go upstairs. Let's go see mommy. Okay. And then we have the, we have the opportunity you know, to really help the city to change the way people get around. And this mm -hmm. question, no question in my mind, this is something that we at this time, we keep talking about we're living in the era 
and people need options to be able to get around safety. You know, I have somewhere exactly since this stuff happened. You know, me and my family were like, we're kind of in downtown Brooklyn, which is lovely. I got lots of places that I can walk to, but I want to go places that are further than my stroll. My, my my options, options are limited. limited. You know, I'm, I'm looking, looking forward to being able to, to, to have, have more options. options. Mm -hmm. And you know, whether it's a, uh, you know, the, the Vespa style scooters, which is a sit down scooter, speaking to what uh, Curtis was saying before, or other uh, variations in development. These things are important because people need the option. You need mm -hmm. to get around quickly, safely, conveniently, with less stress. And that's where my micro mobility really can make a difference for all of us. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about Super Pedestrian, the company? Yeah, so they, they've actually been around since about 2014. Uh, they started in this uh, lab at MIT called the Sensible City Lab, which mm. is part of the urban planning department there. But just looking at ways to use technology to make cities work better was really what they were all about. So. They saw the micromobility micro revolution, revolution coming, coming, and so they were so trying to figure, figure out how to solve some you know, pretty vexing problems that have faced micromobility micro since, since its inception, inception you know, the first, the first of, which of which we've touched on, which is safety. safety. You know, how do you how keep do you a keep fleet, you know, hundreds, hundreds thousands, thousands of vehicles, vehicles how do you ensure how do you that those vehicles are safe before someone you know, gets on one? You can't really afford to pay a person to inspect a vehicle every time right before someone rides it, that would just be a logistical nightmare. So they started figuring out like, how can we use technology to like remotely sense and even diagnose and even fix some small safety issues. Cause most of the issues that happen with these vehicles are electrical. Some are mechanical, it usually has some, something to do with like a loose wire, water penetrate penetration and like getting into the battery. Right. Um, you know, so, they figured out that like, hey, we can actually ensure the vehicles are safe using technology. And that sort of led to more on onboard computing on, on the vehicles. Also led them to realize that they couldn't just buy off the shelf scooters, nor could they even just modify existing scooters. They really had to build a new scooter from scratch. And so that's really what sets the company apart that, you know, super pedestrian actually has control over its whole supply chain designs mm -hmm. every component on the scooter. So that allows us to do really fancy, cool stuff with the geofencing that I mentioned, right? Where we're able to really enforce those boundaries uh, as we demonstrated in the Navy Yard. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a great company. It's a bunch of engineering nerds, which, you know, fun to work with. And I think, again, culturally, I think more in tune with cities versus, um, you know, a big, a big fund that's just trying to look for a payday, you know, so. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, Any plans for a retail product or strictly staying with the shared model? Good question. You know, I think, I think for now we're, we're sticking with the shared. The company does have a retail product called the Copenhagen wheel, which is a, um, a red electric wheel that you can put on any bike. You've probably mm -hmm. seen this around. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, you can turn any bike into an electric bike. It's just the wheel oh, really? itself that charges and runs, and then it mm -hmm. runs off your smartphone. Mm -hmm. um, wow. So that's a cool product. And mm -hmm. I think we'll see some consumer offerings. But, you know, the shared mobility revolution is just where the action is right now because mm -hmm. the demand is just so strong. Tall Paul was saying before that demographically, people are coming to scooters in a way that they just haven't come to bikes, right? You see more women on scooters. You see more people of color on scooters. You see just people who never even biked before on scooters, right? So it's a real sort of democratizing thing that we're seeing. And so I think we're shared is, is, is where the action is now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's take a quick look at that Copenhagen wheel. That actually looks pretty interesting there. Oh, there it is. Wow. Wow. So, so so tell me, tell me uh, Paul, uh, with my uh, I have, I have a hybrid, hybrid Raleigh. Raleigh. Yeah, I could, yeah, get, I could this get this, and it, and would, it would automatically, automatically be converted, converted to an electric, to an electric. Yeah. electric, electric assist. assist. Yep, exactly, yep. electric, electric assist. assist. Wow, wow. Night, Night Watchman. Watchman. I might slide, slide one on <laughs> next time we go out. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And, you and so you're saying that. Him, I want the commission. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I want to know. So, 
this is the same technology as your link guys it's a lot of the same the same brains right that like uh, uh, governing, governing the you know the battery, battery and the way that the the, the battery, the battery uh, uh, you know powers the motor, the motor um, all, all the sensors, sensors that know if there's like uh, you know an acceleration, an acceleration issue, issue or, or now if the scooters are breaking issue and, and so these are you know patented, patented techniques that we, that we use to um, um, you know monitor, monitor and ensure these vehicles are safe and so I think it's really uh, I like working for a company where safety is job one you know because it really really has to be and so. Yeah, get, yeah you know, we, I'd love to uh, see what I could do to hook you up with one of those, Curtis. Um, hey! You know, I, uh, I've you know, we've known each other for some time, and I just, you know, from, I will from be back in the day when, when putting a bike lane on the street was, like, oh my the most God. controversial thing you could ever Not do. CB10. Okay, well, let, let's, just, let's just admit something. This is what we need to do to, to stay, uh, stay up with John Lynch. <laughs> <laughs> John Lynch, this show is dedicated to you, buddy. As a matter of fact, he, as you know, he rode from Harlem. Yeah. To the yeah. So yeah, yeah, he's definitely one of a kind, for sure. Oh, man, I ride from Brooklyn to Co-op City. I don't want to hear right. That's halfway. What kind of soul? <laughs> I knew that you would steal the thunder, Paul. Paul, I knew that. Man, no, it's not actually. In in all seriousness, um, I you know. I think that bike riding is a very good way of staying healthy. Uh, I, I like, you know, e-bikes because they offer, you know, options to people to, you know, to ride more. Uh, me, I'm like, when I go out on my bike, I never get the exercise. Even like now, I just like the city bikes that are e you, know, you know what we call this? We call this, we call this going acoustic. If you, if you don't like the, e the electric, just keep it, keep it acoustic. That's, that's tall Paul. I'm an acoustic guy myself. Um, my bike is my number one mode of transportation. I probably ride the subway maybe a smattering of times during the course of the year more when it gets cold but uh i pretty much go up and down uh, um, the island of manhattan on my bike and uh my wife is even she's even more adventurous than me she'll you you can catch her in the bronx brooklyn queens you know she's pretty much been everywhere but staten island on her bike <laughs> nice and yeah. I've been to Staten Island. I can tell you it's a pretty nice place. It is a nice place to ride, uh, you know. It's, if, I, if I may, you know, just uh, I learned more about our city uh, while working for Lyme than I could have possibly imagined. I rode about miles on behalf of Lyme, uh, primarily uh, in Staten Island and the waterways, but also in the in the campaign to get the e-bikes e e legalized, I did 35 different district offices for council people and state assembly and state senate folks. Uh, I gave any number of safety demonstrations to talk about not just the viability of the products, but also talk about safety protocols, road rules, and rules that people could could use and adapt to so they could be safe on their scooter or bicycle. I, again, I, I tell Paul that to me, safety is not just job, job, it's one, two, and three. Because notices when something good happens on the on micro mobility, whether it's a, an e scooter or a Vespa style scooter, everyone notices when someone does something wrong. Okay? And every time somebody does something wrong, that's, That's trouble, trouble for you because the people that are like not in my backyard are going to say, oh, wait, I saw that guy over there or that woman over there. They weren't wearing a helmet. They went the wrong way. They ran the light. That's the stuff that is, makes it so much more difficult to get you know, cities to buy, let, let alone the actual dangers that come from riding a, a vet style scooter at 30 miles an hour without a helmet. You know, those kinds of you know, that's, yeah, kind, that's of kind of common sense, sense. but common, common sense, sense is not common. common. We all know so, that. I'll stop so, preaching. Gentlemen, we're at the end of our time here. One, if you guys have a few last comments you'd like to share and information on where people can find out more about yeah, the Link yeah. Scooter. I mean, really, what's top of mind right now for me is just how great it's been to be on the show. I mean, uh, this has been so fun and, you know, um, 
just, just great, great, great exchange. exchange. You, know, you know, so, so link.city link. is our is our, our, website. our website. You know, mm -hmm. uh, simple, simple. link.city, link. city. mm -hmm. and uh, you'll be uh, hearing you'll hear you know more about us. About us. Uh, we're uh, hopefully going to be doing a demo in a neighborhood near you. Nice, nice. Harlem, baby. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. All right. Link dot city. Okay. okay. Very Oops, nice. That's something else. Um, and uh, Tall Paul, any last comments? Uh, last comment for me is this. Uh, we are very lucky and blessed to live in a city like New York where pretty much everyone wants to be even in the COVID era. And we have opportunities to make our city better. We have opportunities to improve our transportation infrastructure. We have the opportunity to improve the ways that people can utilize that infrastructure. Uh, I'm a big believer in teaching the teacher how to do this right. So if you if you talk to people about how to ride their scooters safely and appropriately before they're deployed, then there's a real chance that you can make things better. And I and I want to be a part of that. I am a part of that to an extent, but I, I look forward to helping people to learn how to do this stuff right. Excellent. Well, Paul and Paul, I want you guys to know that you have an open invitation to Soul Lounge Primetime. And if there's any changes in terms of what you guys have presented, let's say you guys get awarded the contract with uh, NYC, come back on the show and tell us about it. And if we lose, we don't get to come back on the show. No, no, you get to come back, but you'll have to have those Copenhagen wheels with you. <laughs> Night watchman, that's it. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Thanks for joining us. Right. It's been Soul Lounge Primetime, WHCR 90.3 FM. Also find us on YouTube, Soul Lounge Primetime channel, and also on Facebook.com slash Soul Lounge Primetime. See you next week. Take care, guys. Take care, guys. All right. Thanks.